Um, so welcome to NYUSJP's Israeli Apartheid Week. As you may know, Israeli Apartheid Week is an international series of events designed to raise awareness about Israel's apartheid policies towards the Palestinian people and to build support for the growing international movement to boycott, divest, and sanction the state of Israel for its ongoing war crimes against the Palestinian people. 119 faculty at NYU have thus far signed on to an open letter calling on NYU to divest from companies that violate international law and human rights in Palestine and to adopt a human rights screen. So our event tonight features two very distinguished individuals who will be speaking about a very important topic. The name of our event tonight is Mowing the Lawn, Ongoing Israeli Violence in Gaza. For the last 60 years, in the last 60 years, the state of Israel has carried out 15, uh, roughly 15 large-scale military invasions into the small Palestinian enclave of Gaza. Each one of these invasions caused anywhere between dozens to thousands of deaths. Most of these invasions have taken place while Gaza remains under Israeli military occupation. That is, Israel has been systematically invading and massacring a territory that is already under its military control. These invasions have become so common that Israeli military leaders have called the process mowing the lawn. The term is accurate. Not only have these invasions of Gaza become completely normal, happening every two to three years, but they are indiscriminate. Like a lawnmower cutting down blades of grass, so Israeli invasions into Gaza cut down humanity, destroying hospitals, schools, universities, mosques and churches, media stations, apartment buildings and homes. And while the world occasionally criticizes these mass killings, much of the anguish and attention quickly dissipates even as the aggression continues. Even after the Israeli invasion of Gaza, which took place this summer, killing 2,100 Palestinians, most of them civilians, Gaza is still in danger. Israel has allowed virtually no rebuilding material into Gaza. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in Gaza remain displaced and homeless without access to medical care. Indeed, Palestinian children continue to freeze to death, having inadequate access to shelter. So our first speaker is Joe Catron. Joe is a freelance journalist who is present in Gaza during this summer's invasion. Joe bravely assisted medical teams in search and rescue groups while bearing witness to the carnage that was visited upon the community with whom he lived for three and a half years. Joe will be giving a presentation on what he, along with millions of others in Gaza, saw with their own eyes as Israeli war planes dropped roughly 20,000 tons of explosives on Gaza. Our event tonight is not about an abstract subject or a galaxy far, far away. The ongoing aggression being visited upon the people of Gaza in particular and the Palestinian people as a whole reaches right to our doorstep here at NYU in the United States. Every bomb that Israel has dropped on the people of Gaza was made in the United States. The United States has provided hundreds of billions of dollars in weaponry to Israel over the last 60 years the vast majority of it used illegally. Major U.S. companies, many of which we believe to be included in NYU's uh, endowment, continue to provide Israel with military equipment, weaponry, and other resources to continue to subjugate and control the Palestinian people. And all the while, the atrocities that Israel has committed with the banality of mowing the lawn have been treated as completely normal, even here at NYU. Last fall, NYU Law School decided to embrace the so-called Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, as an institutional part of this law school, shortly after forum director Thane Rosenbaum told us that Palestinian civilians in Gaza had forfeited their right to be called civilians because of how some of them had voted during a 2006 election. And a few months later, an NYU law school group decided to invite Iran Shamir Bor, the Israeli military advisor who signed off on Israeli strikes against civilians in Gaza to provide a propaganda presentation to law students. And just last week, dozens of NYU law students, you might be noticing a pattern here, uh, decided to spend their spring break on an Israeli propaganda vacation to meet with members of the Israeli government. They relaxed on land, stolen from the Palestinian people, and to which millions of Palestinian refugees are barred from returning, including roughly 80% of the people of Gaza who are Palestinian refugees. And despite this campaign by the state of Israel, its American supporters and enablers, and the institutions of power throughout our country to make Israeli aggression normal and acceptable, they have and will continue to meet opposition. Because it is our role as students and intellectuals and as communities of conscience not to give impunity to regimes that commit the atrocities that you will hear about today. That is why we continue to organize, continue to boycott and divest, and continue to speak out of the, against the aggression being visited upon the people of Palestine. And you should join us. There are no two sides to institutional oppression. When you've decided to be neutral in a time of injustice, you've already chosen the side of the oppressor. And with that, I'll hand it over to Joe Catron. Well, 
Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Amit. Thank all of you very much for having me here tonight. Before I get into my presentation, I'd like to start with a short excerpt from a Rush documentary that was made about the 2014 offensive, and this came out a few months ago. Now, shoot. Hospital in downtown Gaza City is the biggest hospital and the most important one in the Strip, especially in wartime under a tight siege. I want to ask everyone who done this reward, if, it, if this child is yours, what do you feel? I am here because the Israeli occupation bombed us. This war results in high numbers of casualties. People dying every day. Her family name is Al Bakri. She's three months old. Let the world see her. These are the targets the Israeli occupation claim to be terrorists. This is the army's language, but the whole world should see this child and decide whether she is a terrorist or a target, as the Israeli occupation claims. Shifar Hospital in downtown Gaza City is the biggest hospital. That was, that's a little bit of the scene at Shifa Hospital where I was in and out of, particularly for the last several weeks of the offensive. Right. I've been asked to speak, among other things, about media in Gaza as it pertains to the to the summer 2014 experience, whatever we want to call it. I'll be doing a little bit of that, but putting it in a very broad context. And if you have any more specific questions about the media aspect of things, please feel free to raise them during the question and answers at the end. I hope we'll have plenty of time for that. I'm going to start off by going very quickly through a few preliminary areas, which are, I think, necessary to fully understand what happened and continues to happen in Gaza, and I know many of you are familiar with this material already, so I'll be going through it quickly. The first of these is ethnic cleansing, particularly Israel's expulsion of 650,000, or excuse me, 750,000 Palestinians starting in 1947 and continuing for several years. This is a policy that had been planned well in advance. You see here a quote from Yosef Weitz, who was the director of land and a forestation department of the Jewish National Fund. And he wrote in 1940, there is no way but to transfer the Arabs from here to the neighboring countries, to transfer all of them, save perhaps for Bethlehem, Nazareth, and the old Jerusalem. Not one village must be left, not one tribe. The transfer must be directed at Iraq, Syria, and even Transjordan. For this goal, funds will be found. And the JNF certainly managed to do its share of finding the funds. There's no question about that. And these, by the way, are pictures from a few Nakba Day protests in Gaza during my time there. Between 1947 and 1949, as I said, Zionist militias and then later the Israeli army expelled 750 thousand Palestinians and killed 13,000 more. 531 Palestinian villages were destroyed and 11 urban neighborhoods were also emptied. 
Today, over 9 million Palestinians are refugees and internally displaced persons. They comprise 74% of the global Palestinian population, a supermajority. And this is particularly important in understanding Gaza, because the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, produced Gaza in a couple of different ways. The first is its barriers. The Gaza Strip didn't exist as any sort of administrative unit prior to 1948. The enclave that you see today is simply the portion of historic Palestine, specifically in the southwest, that Israel failed to ethnically cleanse during those operations. And the second is, of course, its population. As Amit said, the population of the Gaza Strip today consists 80% of Palestinian refugees, making it, I believe, the most refugee-heavy territory in the world. And here's one more quote before I move on that will give you some idea of the sources of the current conflict that exists. This is from Moshe Dayan, who held a number of position, high positions in the Israeli government, but said this when he was the Army's Chief of General Staff in April 1956. What cause have we to complain about their fierce hatred to us? For eight years now, they sit in their refugee camps in Gaza, and before their eyes we turn into our homestead the land and villages in which they and their forefathers have lived. Let us make our reckoning today. We are a generation of settlers, and without the steel helmet and gun barrel, we shall not be able to plant a tree or build a house. And I should add, although it isn't as much of a factor in understanding the context of the 2014 offensive that Israel's ethnic cleansing of Palestinian, Palestinians continues through means that vary from its revocations of residency permits for Palestinians in East Jerusalem to forcing former Palestinian prisoners, such as Hannah Shalabi, who you see here, or Sam Arasawi, to leave their homes in East Jerusalem or the West Bank and relocate to the Gaza Strip as a condition of their release. And that brings me to the second necessary precursor, which is the issue of prisoners. Israel began its prison enterprise early between 1945, 1948 excuse me, and 1955. Thousands of Palestinians inside Israel were interned in at least 22 concentration and forced labor camps. This is something that's only really been broadly exposed recently, by the way. Last year, the Journal of Palestine Studies post, um, published a new article, a new survey of this period in history, which had never been fully explored before, if anyone's Remotely interested, I highly recommend that you read it. And then following its June 1967 occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, Israel embarked on a much more systematic regime of incarceration. Since 1967, Israel has detained over 650,000 Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza Strip alone. And here we shouldn't discount those Palestinians who are held as political prisoners from within 1948 Palestine, what's claimed as the state of Israel, but their numbers have not been quite as high. Israel currently holds 6,000 Palestinian political prisoners. All but 100 of them are from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 455, ugh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I can't speak tonight, but 455 of them are administrative detainees or unlawful combatants held under one of two laws which allow Israel to detain Palestinians indefinitely without charge or trial. The unlawful combatant law, by the way, was initially adopted to allow Israel to hold Lebanese civilians as hostages for possible prisoner exchanges. But since its 2005 redeployment of settlers and ground troops from the Gaza Strip, it's also been used against Palestinian residents there. 17 pris current prisoners are elected members of the Palestinian Legislative Council, and 376 are residents of the Gaza Strip. There are a number of issues that concern prisoners. Israel routinely tortures Palestinian prisoners, particularly to coerce confessions during their interrogations. The number who are tortured recently spiked um, 
an Israeli organization, the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, published a study a few weeks ago showing a sharp escalation after the launch of Israel's military operations in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip last year. Prisoners are often denied access to adequate health care and legal counsel. Israel routinely obstructs or cancels family visits, and between April 2007 and April 2012, banned all visits to Palestinian prisoners from the Gaza Strip. This policy, by the way, was only revoked as the result of a mass hunger strike by Palestinian prisoners during 2012, which succeeded in modifying a number of highly repressive Israeli policies. Israel has continued to prevent Gaza children from visiting their imprisoned parents and currently bars those older than 15. The number has been constantly rising since the hunger strike. Currently, it stands at 15. And other relatives are often prohibited from prison visits because of unspecified security concerns. Now this last part, this last part will be important for understanding the 2014 offensive. These are several ways in which prisoners have been, have, in which the release of prisoners has been won by Palestinians in the past several years. In, eight, in October 2011, Israel released 1,027 prisoners, nearly all Palestinians, in exchange for an Israeli prisoner of war held by Hamas. And now, seeing this, I realize I made a mistake. This was divided into two batches, roughly half and half. The first was released in October 2011. The second was a few months later. But that was the total number. My apologies. Then starting in April 2012, Israel began releasing a small number of prisoners, including Khadr Adnan, Hannah Shalabi, who you saw a few slides back, and Samar Asawi, after they launched individual hunger strikes demanding their freedom. And between August and October 2013, Israel released 78 prisoners as part of negotiations with the Palestine Liberation Organization. Finally, the siege. And I should make clear that although the siege is often spoken of as if it were one single coherent thing, this is a bit of a misnomer. It's understandable because that's the way it can feel on the ground. But what we call the siege is actually the accumulation of hundreds of Israeli laws, policies, and military regulations which came into effect over a number of decades, and some of which overlap in varying degrees with both the West Bank and 48 Palestine as well. Um, in its earliest form, it started not long after the Nakba. In 1954, Israel adopted its Prevention of Infiltration Law, formally barring the return of ethnically cleansed Palestinian refugees from the Gaza Strip and elsewhere. Previously, it would have simply machine gunned them. Now it also had a law saying that their return was illegal. After its June 1967 occupation of the Gaza Strip, Israel barred international traffic from the Gaza seaport since then, it's been the only Mediterranean seaport from which international travel is prohibited. In 1989, Israel, for the first time began since 1967, began restricting the exit of Palestinians from the Gaza Strip. In 1991, Israel restricted the import and export of Palestinian products to and from the Gaza Strip. Also in 1991, Israel banned Palestinians from in the Gaza Strip from moving to the West Bank without rarely issued exit permits. In 1993, at the height of the second, excuse me, the first Intifada, Israel first imposed an overall closure on both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and that was later lifted, but has since been reimposed any number of times every year in the West Bank, while it's been more or less continuous in the Strip. In 1994, Israel failed to implement the terms of its Jericho Agreement, which had agreed to allow Palestinian fishermen the use of 20 nautical miles from the Gaza seaport, continued to restrict them to six. In 2000, Israel prohibited Gaza Strip students from studying at Palestinian universities in the West Bank. And in 2001, Israel restricted the use of land within a kilometer of its separation barrier with the Gaza Strip. So by 2001, a great number of the things which we would call the siege today were already in place. 
And of course, following Hamas's electoral, electoral victory in 2006, Israel escalated many of these measures. It, it initially imposed economic sanctions on both, both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, withholding tax revenues and limiting trade. It's also withholding tax revenues now. Um, existing restrictions on the use of the Gaza Strip's land and sea were increased and enforced much more ruthlessly than they had been. Following the internal clashes in Gaza in 2007, Israel lifted its sanctions on the West Bank while enforcing a comprehensive closure on the Gaza Strip, which has more or less persisted to this day with small modifications here and there. Imports of most products and nearly all exports were prohibited at that time, and travel to and from the Gaza Strip, which was already severely restricted, became nearly impossible. Now, I'm not going to spend too much, on time, too much time on this. This is simply a May 2010 list of items which were permitted and prohibited for import into Gaza. And if you just want to glance at it quickly and notice how ridiculous it is, it's permitted to import all canned foods except canned fruit, which is prohibited. It's permitted to import dried meat, but not fresh meat, etc. It's permitted to import coffee and tea, but not sage. There's really no possible logic behind this beyond collective punishment. I've never heard any possible explanation of what military use sage could have. Can start a nuclear program. Can start a nuclear program. One of my friends jokingly suggested that at the time, nuts and um, Seeds and nuts were prohibited because they could be used to grow trees from which dangerous spears could be fashioned. And that list, by the way, was considerably abbreviated in 2010 as a result of outrage over Israel's attack on the first Freedom Flotilla and the deaths of initially nine, later 10 Turkish activists on board, or nine Turks and one Turkish American. Israel was forced to allow the imports of most civilian goods into the Gaza Strip, not all. For example, the restrict import of building materials was still severely restricted. But it's also crucial to remember that it continued to prohibit the export of nearly anything, making any, making any sort of a functional economy that was not dependent on international aid clearly impossible. And the ceasefires. This is the most, has been the most immediate precursor to each of the last three Gaza offensives. A ceasefire and then Israel's violation of it. In June 2008, Israel and Hamas negotiated a ceasefire through the mediation of Egypt in which both agreed to restrain their fire, to hold their fire, and Israel agreed to lift its siege of the Gaza Strip. And it always does this in very vague terms, so it's hard to tell exactly what they're promising to do. But you can tell by looking at it that they're promising to do something, and then they inevitably do anything. So that much at least is clear. For the next six months, or almost six months, um, although Israel's near daily aggressions on the Gaza Strip, gunfire along the separation barrier and at sea continued, Palestinian fire shrank to nearly nothing. Um, 11 mortars overall were fired, for example, in the month of October. Does anyone know what a mortar is? Have you ever seen one? It's like a step up from a potato gun. It's not what anyone brings to an actual fight. Then in November, on November 4th, Israel launched an unprovoked attack along the barrier inside the Gaza Strip, killing eight members of Hamas. This sparked this Yes, this sparked an increase in hostilities, which culminated in the carnage of Operation Cast Lead at the end of that year. Then in 2014, shortly after Ahmed al-Jabari, a senior commander in Hamas's al-Qasim brigades, had actually, what's that? 2012, you're right, I'm sorry. In 2012, after Ahmed al-Jabari, a senior commander in Hamas's al-Qasim brigades, 
had actually received a, an Israeli proposal for a long-term ceasefire through Gershon Baskin, who is an Israeli guy who's kind of Israel's de facto negotiator with Hamas. But anyway, he had this thing in hand. It was being considered. And Israel picked that moment to launch an airstrike assassinating him, beginning the next eight-day offensive. At the end of that offensive, um, another ceasefire was reached, again with the mediation of Egypt. There's something of a pattern here. Israel once again agreed to refrain from attacking the Gaza Strip and to at least modify its siege. Once again, it did neither. Over the next three months, this is a graph that was designed by the British journalist and activist Ben White, and you can see the numbers. Um, four Palestinians were killed and 91 were injured by Israeli fire into the Gaza Strip, including 63 shooting attacks, 13 army incursions, 30 naval attacks on fishermen at sea. At the same time, towards the end of this reporting period, if I recall, two mortars were fired over the fence and didn't land very far from it, because as I said, mortars are not terribly impressive. This Israeli aggression continued for the next couple of years. You can see here how the Palestinians eventually began responding. They weren't able to refrain from it forever. But their responses typically tracked the scale of Israeli attacks and certainly never rose anywhere near the same level. This is numerical. Um, Israeli fire versus Palestinian fire. And then finally, in June 2012 of last, uh, 2014 of last year, after three young settlers disappeared in the West Bank, Israel launched an all-out military assault there. Most say the most severe military operation it's conducted in the Gaza in the West Bank since the Second Intifada while also escalating its attacks on the Gaza Strip, bombing it nearly every day. This is a graph that was put out actually the day that the cabinet voted for an official military operation against the Gaza Strip on July 7th. But by that point, 23 Palestinians had already been killed, 19 by the military and four by Israeli settlers. There had been 387 incursions into the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And keep in mind, this was over less than a month. 2,400 raids on homes, businesses, and civil institutions. And just to keep it classy, Israeli soldiers had stolen $2.9 million worth of Palestinian stuff. They often do that. This eventually led to <laughs> the offensive. Um, the Palestinians responded, particularly after Israel killed a member of the local law enforcement who was actually responsible for enforcing the ceasefire by the barrier on June 30th. At that point, Hamas fired its first rocket in, I think, over a year. And several days later, on June 7th, Israel voted to invade the Strip. This is something that was published in a regional newspaper on July 4th by a reporter who was in touch with a number of people on the ground. And it's a fair assessment of the local mood at the time. People in Gaza have grown accustomed to nightly bombings. They know when they start and when they end. They even know what the targets they even know the targets that the occupation repeatedly strikes, mostly vacated headquarters and training sites. Under these circumstances, one obvious question comes to mind. Why is the resistance still silent? Because even at that point, three days before the Israeli vote, Palestinians weren't responding in nearly the same measure as Israel was attacking them. Now, there are a couple of elements about the offensive itself that I'd like to bring to your attention. One is the way it was, the way it began. And the first part of that is how it was localized. For several days after it began, for those of us who'd been in the Strip for previous offensives in 2012 or 2008 and 9, it didn't feel very real. 
it was possibly possible to get into a car and go to a bomb site somewhere else. This was a airstrike within the first few days. But for the most part, if you were outside a few key areas that were being heavily targeted, it was pretty quiet. That would eventually change. But it had a lot to do with the way that Israel was methodically conducting the operation. The other thing that became quickly apparent was the targeting of civilian homes. And this was something that hadn't been done on the same scale before. In 2009, striking civilian homes was the last red line Israel crossed before a ceasefire. While in 2014, it was their first strategy. Oh, I'm going backwards. The first, which they did on the very first night. And this certainly became clear as the casualties mounted. In 2012, for example, everyone was shocked by the massacre of the al Dalu family. I believe 11 of them were killed in a strike on their home. And this was something remarkable. In 2014, it very quickly became impossible to keep track of the number of comparable massacres. There were simply too many of them happening. And as I said, this was very localized. And over the course of the offensive, it got a little louder in the rest of the Strip. And there were localized airstrikes. But for the most part, the, the real onslaught continued to be along the separation barrier. This is an example of one strike somewhere else. The four, these are three boys from the Bakker family who survived Israel's famous shelling of the, on the beach, which killed four of them. But there were many more incidents in these kinds of areas. Uh, Rafa in the south, Kuza also towards the south, Deir al-Bala, the narrowest part of the Gaza Strip where Jihad lives. And I imagine he'll have something to say about that. And Beit Hanun in the north. And I spent a, a lot of time, not necessarily all of it, here just east, on the eastern edge of Gaza Strip in an area called Shijaya. A few pictures from it. Shijaya was an area where a number of quasi-famous incidents happened. It's where, for example, Salem Shamali was killed by an Israeli sharpshooter while looking for his family who, as it turned out, weren't there. And it's also where Israel repeatedly bombarded Al Wafa Hospital, the only rehabilitation hospital in the Gaza Strip, for a number of days before forcing its evacuation and then fully destroying it. Now, when we talk about these incidents, there are a couple of things worth highlighting. One is that the most famous incidents aren't necessarily unique. The shelling and destruction of Al-Wafa Hospital, the killing of Salem Shamali, or even the shelling of the four Bakr boys on the beach. There were many such incidents. What's unique about these is the way they were documented, and the documentation of them was disseminated quickly, drawing attention to them. And the other thing I'd like to bring your attention is the model which international media use when covering incidents like this, the 2014 escalation. It's very crisis oriented. As soon as something big happens in the Gaza Strip or elsewhere, they will immediately deploy hundreds of fresh journalists to cover it. And these people are not specialists of any sort, to put it mildly. It can be a little shocking how little some of them know, and they may have been somewhere like Ukraine or Venezuela only the previous day. It's very possible. And this tends to impoverish the coverage, both by leaving out essential information, which happens a great deal, but also by omitting necessary context, everything which has happened, leading up to the immediate clashes which they're there to cover. And I have a little more I'd like to say, but I feel like I'm already eating into Jihad's time. So I'll end it here for now and look forward to your questions. Thank you.